Rangers. Welcome to Eco Ask Why. Today we have an idea episode and we're going to be talking about industrial marketing for manufacturers in 2022. And I'm bringing in the expert, Mr. Joe Sullivan from Gorilla 76. So what's up, Joe? How you doing? Doing well, Chris. Good to be here. Oh man, I'm excited to have you here on Eco Ask Why because I've personally, I've been following you for a long time. You put so much great content out there. I've learned a lot from you. So I'm excited for this conversation and, and you know, you, you shared an article with me. It made a big impact. I was like, look, let's just unpack that together on, on Eco Ask Why. Awesome. I'm, I'm ready to do it. All right. Well, we have an industrial audience, so maybe set this stage for the listeners out there. So how do you explain what industrial marketing is to someone who is new to this industry? Sure. Well, I think, you know, I always say that the manufacturing sector in general, you know, it tends to be very sales heavy. Um, the perception of marketing tends to be, um, let's go to trade shows and have a fancy booth. Uh, maybe we run some print ads, maybe we're do, doing a little pay-per-click and that's probably about as modern as we get. Um, and our perspective on marketing for manufacturers or industrial marketing is that marketing needs to be a revenue engine for the company. It needs to be about uh, creating opportunities for sales, not just sort of another expense on the P&L that is sort of a, a nice to have, but not a, a must have. Absolutely. I mean, that's that's the key part the revenue engine because it's, it's oftentimes, like you said, just looked at as an expense, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's that's pretty much what I've seen for, you know, I've been been working with manufacturers for over a decade uh, as a marketing consultant. And, um, I, you know, I'm starting to see a, a positive mindset shift slowly but surely. But most of the time, there's a lot of sort of educating that I and, and my team have to do on what role marketing actually could play versus the role it actually is playing for them. Uh, sure. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, I guess a lot of it too now has shifted to just the way that people buy, you know, online. So a lot of that power is now gone to the to the buyer itself, right? Absolutely, you're right. You're right on the money there. And you know, that's that's a shift that's probably been happening for 15 years now at this point. But you, know, you think about what it was like, um, you know, back in the say early 2000s, um, where you know most mid-sized manufacturers, if they had a website at all, for example, it was, you know, it was pretty primitive, not a lot of information there. Um, you wouldn't think of it as a resource to your audience. Well, now, now you, you know, you fast forward to 2022 and, you know, whether it's in your personal life or your business world, you think about, well, what's the first thing you do when you're trying to figure something out? You go to Google or maybe, you know, you go to your referral network and when they pass along some resource or name of a company to you, you go check them out online, right? And so I guess the point is the way people gather information has just, you know, shifted dramatically and, and at such a fast pace where, you know, what you need to find is, is at your fingertips. And it's the same is true for the people you're trying to reach. So you, for you to be able to create visibility, for your business to be able to position yourself and your company as an expert resource. Mm -hmm. um, that's how you're going to earn attention and trust and visibility. Yeah, that's right. Cause I mean, you mentioned to be at their fingertips, so you have to be, be there in the moment. And at, when they're, when, when they're trying to solve that problem, that's where you need to be in front of them, you know, in, in that exact moment of time. That's exactly right. And it's not just, you know, I always say that if you're, if you're talking to procurement, you're too late because you think about your audience. And for a lot of my, my clients, it's, you know, these are companies selling CapEx equipment, or at least, at least what they're selling is, you know, requires a consultative sale and often a longer buying process. And they're talking to engineers and they're talking to plant managers and they're talking to CFOs. And so you think about the people early in the buying process for, for your product or your service. Um, and a lot of times it's people who are on the shop floor. It's, it's, might be welders or machinists or you know people operating machinery uh, could be plant managers you know trying to increase three throughput and you know eliminate downtime and like these are the people who are experiencing some kind of issue that they need mm -hmm. to solve or trying to improve a process or achieve some goal and you want to be their resource you want them to 
you want to be able to provide them with help around what they're trying to accomplish as it relates to your area of expertise. And if you can, if you can be that person to them, um, you're going to earn attention and trust in a lot of cases before they ever even enter a buy cycle. And then you're the first one they think of when they do. Right. So, I mean, if you are a manufacturer then, and you're trying to, to get in that, to be an early influencer, it sounds like to me, you know, what you're trying to do, you're trying to really get in there and influence them to, to well, to help them, but then also influence them to use you. So how do you determine who's making those purchasing decisions if you are that manufacturer out there? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it comes down to just understanding your audience. You know, if if you work with you know, a lot of the a lot of the clients have, that we've worked with over the years, they have a variety of different audiences they serve and product lines. But if you think about, you know, what are your most profitable areas of your business? Where you where do you see you know growth potential? Where are you really focused on growing? Well, think about you got to dial in on who who the audience is. Who are the types of companies you're trying to reach, and then understand. Who are those buying process influencers? And I mean, you're going to learn these things just through experience, right? You probably know a lot of you probably already know this. You know that there is some plan engineer, automation engineer, or somebody who is probably the most influential person in the buying process. And so the way we always recommend doing it is once you can identify who those most important influencers are, then you need to deeply understand them. And so I'm a big fan of you know voice of customer work, customer interviews. Um, spending time saying, you know, actually talking to these people in an intentional way, we've found for for ourselves and for our clients as they, you know, as they approach their own audiences that people are happy to talk, you know, for you to approach some of your best customers and say, hey, we're trying to get better at what we do. We're trying to understand, you know, how our audience look, they understand their issues better, understand what it was that led them into the buying process and what mattered to them. And if you can collect those insights directly from the mouths of the people you're trying to reach so that you can then reach others who look like them and experience the same issues that, they, that they're that they having, um, then you've really got the foundation for you know starting to build a, a marketing strategy. Right, right. So, I mean, is that is that easy? To embrace, have you seen some some resistance to embrace that strategy? Because I mean, VOCs, I've been doing them for years. I, mm -hmm. I think they're the best way to get the the best intel. Period. But I'll be honest, Joe, I've had I've struggled with salespeople, you know, leaning into that and wanting to do voice of customers and doing surveys and things like that. Because uh, I I just I don't know why that's like they they don't see the value. So maybe give some advice. What's the best way to get some buy-in to, to, to get those people to lean into to that strategy? Yeah. It's funny you say that because we see that kind of resistance sometimes too. And we push hard through it, you know, as a, as an agency that, um, you know, consults manufacturers. Uh, I don't know what, exactly what it is, but there is often a hesitation to say, well, I mean, yeah, are you really going to get anything anything insightful out of that conversation? I already know the answer to that. It's absolutely we are, but convincing them, you know, sometimes they'll feel like, well, we're kind of bugging our customers and we don't want to, you know, we don't want to, um, you know, take time out of their day and ask them to do us a favor. Uh, sometimes That's the word I was going to use. I've actually heard sure. that. I don't, I, I've heard people say, I don't want to burn a favor. And that's yeah. like, what? Yeah. I, I think you're, I think you're overthinking it for, for those of you who are thinking that I really, in most cases you are, I, I can't speak for anybody's individual you know case here. And maybe some of you have arguments for why you wouldn't go talk to a customer, but you go into other industries, software, professional services, like this is just normal practice. Like I've posted things on LinkedIn about this in the context of manufacturing saying, you know, talking about the resistance and, and overcoming that resistance to actually having these voice of customer customer interviews and i get people from software commenting on this like is this a joke like why how would how is it possible that you don't go talk to your customers before you do marketing work it's it's just the the accepted norm in other uh in other industries and so i think that's one of those big shifts that has to happen like you know we can all sit here and make assumptions about what our audience cares about the most and what their buying process actually looked like and what triggers led them there and what their most common questions are. And you can gather some of these things through, you know, your sales team, um, you know, having conversations with your sales team and through, um, I don't know, in, in more secondhand ways, but there is no better way than to just hear it from the mouths of the exact people that you are serving. Um, and and I think it's one of those things where you just got to do it and you got to you know go do five of them and and see how people react. You know, if you're sensing annoyance 
uh, okay, well th- then, then maybe you, you give it some second thought, but, um, I just don't, I, I don't think most of you will see that. I think you're going to find that people are happy to help you and you position it as we're, we're trying to be a better company. We're trying to understand our, our customers better. You're one of our best customers. We value our relationship with you and, and we want to hear you. Uh, and, and then if you position it that way, which is, which is true, it's all true. Uh, people are going to be happy to, to help you. I, no doubt. You know, I've, I've actually done this before, Joe, where I had that conversation. I've had those interviews and leaving, I got questioned by people that I was with part of our team on why I didn't sell, mm-hmm. you know, and, and well, we, you were there, you had them, you had them all, asking all these questions, but you never brought up anything we did. And I, my point was that that's not that meeting. Like I'm building a relationship. I'm actually trying to, because you know, empathy and, and you know, humbly asking questions and not trying to push a narrative. And maybe that's where people get tripped up. Do you, do you see that at all? Yeah, absolutely. It's, I, I had a, on, on my own podcast, uh, it was probably a year ago at this point, I had um, Dave Loomis from Loomis Marketing, and he, he's kind of an expert in VOC. It's, it's really his specialty of VOC, okay. st- short for, for voice of customer. And he talked about that being one of the biggest mistakes. Like we are going in here with no intention to sell in these customer interviews, these voice of customer sessions. We, and, and that needs to be communicated to your person on the other end too, because it lets, because they let their guard down then and they're not going to, they're going to give you real answers. And that's what you're seeking here. And and th- this is sort of part of a bigger problem that I see is in, in the manufacturing sector is um, companies don't really understand the difference between marketing and sales a lot. Like doing this voice of customer work to me is this is marketing. This is understanding your audience so you can do a better job crafting messaging so you can do a better job creating content to surround that messaging. Um, so, you know, when you go out there to try to reach people, um, you know, what they're going to respond to or what they're more likely to respond to. Well, this is a precursor to sales. This is to set up better sales conversations and to create better opportunities. And if you're going to use this as an opportunity to jump in and sell, um, you're going to burn trust with these individuals. Then, then you're going to have the problem that I think a lot of people sense as hesitation. You know, that causes the hesitation is, yeah, we're going to we're going to burn the favor. Well, you need to look at this as having a different purpose. This is essentially it's market research. Yes, you know, one thing I've been I've been doing a lot of of podcasts talking about cybersecurity. And just hang hang with me for a second. I I got a point because the one thing that keeps coming up is IT OT convergence. So, you know, th- th- those two worlds typically don't play together. You know, the, the IT world, the OT world, they, they stay separate. Is there a, a marketing sales convergence that, that needs to occur and, and start leaning in to be able to bring these teams together? Because I almost feel like it's a us versus them sometimes, mm-hmm. or maybe they don't see the value, you know, on either side on what the other's doing, you know? So just, just curious, is this co- a common thing you're seeing uh, across the board? Absolutely. Yeah, it really is. And this is, I've been talking about this for over a decade, if I'm being honest, is like you, you find, yeah, I mean, marketing and sales are completely different functions. They just are. They, they need to be working together because ultimately both sides of the business are there to generate revenue. And, you know, marketing's side of that is marketing needs to help Sales. I mean, marketing needs to be the one to uh, understand the audience, to you know, uncover the the key insights that are going to lead go to market strategies. Um, marketing needs to be able to segment the audience and figure out where to target them, how they consume information, um, and then to be the one behind messaging and content. So that they can, so that the company can create the right kind of visibility in front of the right people from the right companies, and start to earn enough attention and trust, so that RFQs start happening and and with the right people, right? And then, and then it's sales that, you know, I think marketing still has a role after say a lead is generated to uh, to help sales, but. Um, if they're all, if, if marketing and sales are working with different audiences in mind and different objectives in mind, and they're not communicating, and when marketing generates a lead, if, if marketing makes the assumption that this is a good lead because on paper it looks good and is getting no input from sales, um, 
then then you're just operating in silos here and it's it needs to be a, a team effort different roles but a, a collaborative right. effort right right and i mean i think that and that once you get that alignment that's when great things can happen it, it really can so yeah mm -hmm. I'm, I'm i'm curious now too maybe we can we'll, we'll, we'll park that for a second because i'm i'm curious now on let's say marketing and and sales they're working together and they get good feedback and we and we know what our our audience is looking for we know what we want to start building for them so how do we start working towards with our subject matter experts and and use their expertise to start scaling this and, and creating content that really builds that trust and attention and things like that yeah um well you know you said subject matter experts and i think that's that's kind of the key term there is you know, once you once you've sort of dialed in on on an audience and you know who those buying process influencers are, now it's a matter of figuring out what is most important to those people. Um, you know, if if it's some engineer, if it's a plant manager, whoever those those key influencers are, what matters most to them? What are the, the triggers that lead them into the buying process? The common questions they're trying to get answered, the pains they're experiencing, the objectives they're trying to achieve. Um, you, you uncover some of that through those customer interviews. You uncover some of that through talking to your sales team and your, um, you know, your your account managers and the people who interact with those people. And so now you know what what the content topics need to be and where how you need to craft messaging. And so now what you do is you go to those subject matter experts. Who are the people on your side? It's often technical professionals. Sometimes it's maybe sales engineers, the people who who's have the expertise on your team to be able to address those common questions and address those pain points and help your prospects figure out how to get to a solution and maybe what total cost of ownership would look like if you did it this way versus this way and what the timeline to ROI would look like and different ways to price things and all the things that matter to that person you're trying to reach and influence you know think about who are the people on your team most qualified to be the helper to those people. And those are the people whose brains you need to tap into to, uh, to create content that surrounds your messaging. And when I'm talking about content, I'm talking about, you know, it could be written content. It could be video content. Um, it could be podcast episodes like this that address those things. It could be hosting live events like webinars or other kinds of digital events. I mean, there are a ton of different ways to produce content, but those insights really need to come from the people on your team who have spent their careers, you know, becoming experts in in those things and can position you as a thought leader, an expert advisor while actually helping the people that you're trying to reach and influence. Sure. Sure. And that, so, I mean, you got the subject matter expert, though. So some, some of those, they have different skill sets and their or comfort levels when creating these contents in different areas. So do you do you try to to force a, a a round peg into a square hole type thing thing where or do you just take some of their natural abilities so maybe they're more of a better writer and try to use that skill and then look for other areas to create the video content and things like that i'm just trying to think about that ex, that engineer who who knows a lot right now but maybe a little camera shy or maybe he's not the best writer or she she's not you know uh, just feeling uh, going on a podcast that she would freeze up. So how do you work with them through some of the, those areas of creation? Yeah, that's, I mean, that's a great question. And it's, it's one we run into all the time because not only may an engineer be an expert, but not want to write or not feel comfortable on camera. Um, but that person has a job to do in the company and it's not marketing in most cases, yeah, right? Yeah, no, no. Right. I think in a, in a top down organization, an organization where the the you know from the top down president or CEO says, "Hey, this matters," and some percentage of these people's time has to be devoted to helping with marketing, even if it's literally one percent of their time. Um, you know, I think that that's going to work best. But the reality is, like you said. A lot of subject matter experts are not going to be the best people to physically create the content. And so I talk about the role of the marketer as being the facilitator of content creation. I think okay. there are instances where the marketer can can actually make the content on behalf mm -hmm. of of you know the team. But um, you know, so a few few diff few examples here, right? So we do something at Gorilla at my agency for ourselves. We do it for our clients. We call it Knowledge Extraction Day, 
we put, we plan, you know, we, we figure out those content topics ahead of time through the process I've already talked about. And we will put a videographer on, on site for a day, sometimes two days. And we get those subject matter experts lined up and maybe it's this engineer and the CEO, or it's, you know, this, this plant manager and this engineer or something. And we will, we will get them talking about a topic and we'll facilitate a conversation and we've got cameras rolling on them. Um, and we'll come out of there with a couple hours worth of video footage that we can break up into 10 long form videos and 20 short form videos for all kinds of different purposes. I mean, that's one way to do it. That's, that's kind of a higher production value way. Another way we do it that we've been doing it, you know, we've been doing it this way for years is you use a journalist and it could be, you know, could be in somebody inside your, your company. It could be a freelancer, it could be an agency, but, um, you get somebody who knows how to pull insights out of people through interviewing. And so you know, what we'll do is we'll, we'll do a little research ahead of time. We'll plan our interview and we'll jump on a Zoom call with a subject matter expert for 20 minutes and we will interview that person and get the insights out of their brain. And then we'll write the content on their behalf and they'll review it and probably offer a few suggested edits. But it's not... It's it's a lot different than setting somebody off and saying, okay, go. You know, we need we need to write content about this very technical topic. Go figure it out and write it. I mean, that's that's gonna it, it's gonna be garbage, right? Like yeah. the insights yeah. have to come from the brain of the expert. So in that case, it's the marketer's job to pull those out and be able to turn that into content in some way. Right. Exactly. You know. So I mean, that, I was just curious how you're going to do that there because for for me here at Eco. I've been able to see, be somewhat of a translator, mm -hmm. you know, from an engineering standpoint. So I have the engineering background. I've been able to work hand in hand with marketing because I see the value, but I, I don't think that's a common approach that, you know, many businesses have. No, it's, it's not. And I think you're unique in, in that sense, honestly, because you've kind of, because you are, you know, you do come from an engineering background and you do see the value. Um, that's the first, you know, first hurdle to get through is helping the technical professionals who have their own job to do at the company to see why their involvement in content creation, for example, is, is essential and why yeah. it matters. So I think there's an education element that has to happen first. So they understand why, you know, taking 30 minutes out of their day once a month to help the marketing team produce some insights is going to matter to the organization. Great point. Great point. And I'll tell you one thing that gets turns heads is, is demand. So maybe we'll just speak to that for a little bit. So how could that manufacturer create demand and, t and be more proactive? Cause that could, that could win some advocates right there. Sure. So, all right, kind of, this is sort of a process we've talked about here, right? Where it's, you, you identify the audience, you learn what matters to them, you create content around those things. Now here's where I think a lot of manufacturing organizations kind of miss is okay. they they sit back they you know they publish great content on their site they maybe they've got a learning center a resource center a blog or whatever you want to call it where they're publishing insights and then they kind of sit back and they wait for people to show up and find it and I mean I I'm a huge advocate for search engine optimization and doing it right but I also know that you can't just rely on Google to uh, to you know fill up your your inbox with RFQs. I mean, maybe you can if you're a, a big organization that, you know, a, a name that everybody knows and uh, you, know, you have a longstanding reputation. Uh, but for most kind of mid sized manufacturers that we talk to, like, there is, y you have to be proactive about going out and getting your message and value proposition and helpful content surrounding that and success stories that, you know, illustrate how you've brought those concepts to life with other companies that look like the people you're trying to reach. And so when you, you, you ask about demand generation, Chris, and what that means to me is we need to go out and understand where the people you're trying to reach consume information online, Google, LinkedIn, Facebook, believe it or not. And we need to intercept them where they're already consuming information. So, you know, one example of this would be something we've found to be wildly successful in a lot of ways is putting some paid media budget behind, say, your LinkedIn effort as a manufacturer and, and saying, okay, LinkedIn, take this video of my expert engineer talking about total cost of ownership on this, you know, around this piece of equipment or something like that, yeah. or this case study where we are telling very briefly and concisely a success story we've had with the exact type of customer we're trying to reach. 
LinkedIn show that video to the 10,000, you know, process engineers in these 10 states in the Eastern United States um, that are at companies of this size in these industry verticals. And once people from those, com- once those exact individuals have on average seen that video three times, then start showing this case study uh, that, you know, illustrates how that problem was brought to life to those exact people. And once they've seen that three times then start showing this ad that sort of talks about ROI and drives to a request a, a quote page. Um, so, this is sort of the power of you know going out where people consume information online because people will not go to Google until they are looking for something and have a need. And for most of you listening right now, a majority of your audience is not actively buying what you sell right now or tomorrow or even this week. Maybe 2 to 5% of them actually are. Um, but especially the more complex and big ticket your, your product is, or offering is, um, you know, those buy cycles only come around so often. And so you need to be in these channels where they are already consuming information, creating value for them, teaching, positioning yourself as a thought leader so that when they enter a buy cycle and they go to Google and they Google search something and they see your name, they already know your name and they trust, they trust you and you're the first one they call. Or better yet, they don't even go to Google. They just call you first because they already know your name. The, the mistake people make is they they treat everybody like they're in buying mode right now. And that's where it's that sales mentality. Let's just blast sales messaging at people. Let's rely on Google only. Well, you know, a majority of your audience isn't going to Google right now. So how, how are you going to capture the other 95%? You have to be where they are and be delivering value to them, not just trying to sell product. No doubt. No doubt. There was a, you, you, you nailed a ton of insight right there. Now I am curious though, because mm-hmm. you got manage, management out there and you know, we have management I'm working with too, to, to they want to understand, they mm-hmm. want to, to get the, the impact, look at the ROI, know what metrics are important. Mm-hmm. And I'm, I'm not about the vanity metrics, man. I mean, likes and all you know, that, that stuff doesn't matter. I mean, mm-hmm. what, I'm curious from you, what are the metrics that, that matter and what should they be looking at to, to make sure that this marketing effort is working? Yeah. So I think the first thing to address here is that there's a very very big difference between business outcomes and marketing KPIs. And I see those things being mistaken often as, you know, for kind of being the same thing. Um, So when I talk about business outcomes, I am talking about revenue pipeline, pipeline revenue, revenue, you know, actual quoted opportunities and resulting revenue. These are the outcomes that you are looking for. Now you have to look at I think where where companies also get you know confused though you know if you've got a six month sales cycle, you're not gonna you're not gonna launch a marketing campaign and see a positive ROI in less than six months or probably in less than nine to twelve months realistically. Right. Um, same thing if if you deployed a a new salesperson tomorrow and you've got a six month sales cycle, you know if you fire that person before they they hit the six or nine month mark you never gave them a fair shot. And so I think what you need to look at is um, you know, what is a reasonable t- timeline, first of all. Um, but th- the metrics you want to look at is you know, ultimately, is revenue growing? Is, is pipeline growing before revenue is growing? Um, these are your North Star metrics. And if you have the right measurement systems in place, if you have if you're using a marketing automation software like HubSpot, if you if you are actively using a CRM like Salesforce, and you have those systems talking to each other, then all of this is measurable. Everything you do out there, for the most part, is measurable. Um, so, you know, talk about other metrics like things that that matter as KPIs are you know things like um, you know is are our key rankings in search engines growing for, for you know the keywords that matter most to your business, especially high intent keywords, like keywords that would indicate some buying intent, um, is, is organic traffic growing and, and especially traffic that is entering through pages on your site that, you know, are related to the the products you actually are, you know, are actually profitable to your business. Um, are you generating, leads through your site that are actually that actually match your ideal customer profile like all of these things matter but they are barometers to show if, to tell you whether you are moving in the right direction toward what are those actual business outcomes mm-hmm. pipeline and resulting revenue so does that make sense it does it does so I'm, I'm still just trying to understand 
mm-hmm. you know, because so much of it is around content and videos and, and blogs and things like that. So I'm just trying to understand, is there, are there numbers, you know, a lot of times for us, you know, we're looking at YouTube, we're trying to lean into YouTube a lot now. So we're trying to understand, is it, is it views more? Is it comments more? Or is it, you know, is it bounces from those, those videos to our website that leads to the, to the pipeline generation, like you're talking about, which mm-hmm. We're, we're still trying to figure all that out too. And I'm sure there's many manufacturers out there in the same boat. Yeah. You know, and, and something we also talk about a lot is that like attribution is, is a very messy thing. It, it just mm-hmm. is. There's not, you know, if, if you're kind of looking for the silver bullet there where you can say, I did, I posted this blog post and it led to this many leads, which resulted in this much revenue. You're, you're probably not looking at the whole picture here. Um, I'll give you an example. So this is this comes from our own business at, at Gorilla. Um, we had we were running a video. Um, it was a video of, of me actually talking on camera about how manufacturers need to shift their marketing mindset to a more revenue focused. You know, it's kind of what we're talking about here, but it was just mm-hmm. a concise, mm-hmm. you know, two mm-hmm. three minute video. And we did what I described earlier, where we were putting a LinkedIn budget behind, like a paid budget behind it, saying we want to target CEOs and presidents of manufacturers in the U.S. who do 10 million to 200 million a year in sales and are of this size. We want to show this video to those exact people. Okay, well, so we were running that and we were looking at things like, uh, you know, what percentage of this video is actually getting consumed? Are people mm-hmm. dropping off before the 50% mark? And we were finding that, you know, 75% of people were watching 75% or more of the video. Like that wow. tells me like there's engagement. We've run other yeah. videos where, you know, people are dropping off after three seconds. And so you, you can make decisions there about, okay, this content is being consumed by the people we're trying to reach. This topic matters. But then taking it a step further and getting, you know, looking at, you know, how do you look at this holistically? Well, so we got an inquiry from a very qualified lead on our site one day. And I went into HubSpot, which is our software for, mm-hmm. we use it for our CRM and our marketing automation software. And I said, okay, where did this lead originate? And it showed me that this particular person who had like a marketing manager job title, um, she found us through a Google search, organic Google search, right? Okay. She landed on our homepage. So what that tells me is if she landed on our homepage, she probably looked for either industrial marketing agency or she probably searched Gorilla 76. If she was searching for, say, manufacturing marketing or something like that, she probably would have... Google would have served her a different page that was targeting that keyword. So so the first thing I could gather is, okay, she probably knew who we were or she searched industrial marketing agency. So I, I went... So we looked into our LinkedIn ads platform and we saw that the CEO of that company had... Um, given a thumbs up and commented on our ad. There it is. Okay, so so yeah. if I was not looking at this holistically, I would have said, okay, this is an organic search lead. She she Google searched and found us. So let's attribute this to Google and let's do more SEO because that's how she found us. And that's how good leads are finding us. No, this company found us through our LinkedIn ad. And what happened in the background that I validated when I actually talked to this woman on the phone is that, yeah, my CEO saw a video of you guys talking about how marketers need to shift their, or manufacturers need to shift their marketing mindset. And he told me to call you. So what did she do? She went to Google. She searched for Gorilla 76. She clicked on our homepage. Boom. She requested a consultation. And so so it's just an example of why, you know, to, to look for that that silver bullet again yeah, it, it's gonna make it's gonna lead you to make decisions that aren't even accurate. Right, right. You know, I could have reinvested everything into SEO if that sort of thing was happening, but if I didn't have the all the information, I would never realize that this LinkedIn campaign is driving really good opportunities for us. Yeah, they're just converting on our site by coming through a different channel. That's a great man. That's a great story. Great story because it, it ties it all together. You know, and, and maybe. One of the last things I wanted to touch base with you on, Joe, mm-hmm. is when when you, when you think through manufacturers, you know, distributors the same way, you have your marketing teams, and for for most, from what I can tell, at least, they're really small, you know, one two people, you know, maybe five, I don't know, but sales teams, they're pretty big, you know, there's a lot of sales resources. So how does that factor in when you're when you're looking at, you know, measuring impact from a marketing standpoint? Does that overall uh, number of, of assets, if you will, should that factor in at all? Should, should, should management think about that? Yeah. I mean, you know, you say 
some of these companies may have a few people, maybe five. You know, in most cases, when I'm yeah, the, the companies that we work with are probably you know on average maybe I don't know if you t- took an average, you're probably working with thirty, forty million dollar manufacturers. Most of huh. them have anywhere from zero to two marketing people right. in house, right? Um, and often it's you know, if it's one person, it's kind of a generalist who, uh-huh. you know, maybe came from a marketing background, maybe just started wearing that hat at one point, And then, you know, that became their, their primary role. Right. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, there, th- the way I look at it is somebody's got to do the work. If you're going to have an impactful marketing program, like this is not, you go turn on some Google ads and then hope that leads start pouring in. Like there are complexities to this. We've talked about a lot of the work that goes sure. into this from, you know, doing the, the, the customer research and voice of customer to creating content to, um, you know, deploying demand generation campaigns to being able to measure results and manage all this in, in the software and the back end. Um, and somebody has got to do that work. So, um, it's, you know, it's to, to evaluate the, the impact of a marketing program um, or, you know, the, the impact of the people working on it. You know, it's, it's not, it's not a simple thing. I'm not exactly sure how yep. to answer your, your question, but, but most resources inside of manufacturers of, you know, kind of in that mid size category, they tend to be, they're 90% sales. And, and when you, when that's, when that's the way you're set up, well, you're, you're, you're set up to do a lot of, you know, relationship nurturing and cold calling and, and flying around the country, going to trade shows. And I'm not saying you shouldn't be doing that, but there's a, a, a huge missed opportunity to be generating demand and to be filling up your, you know, your, those inboxes with opportunities that are generated through marketing. But until the mindset shifts, until it's until until manufacturing leaders can stop saying, "Yeah, marketing's a nice to have," and and they make the website look nice and post pictures of Susie's new dog and the company, you know, volleyball tournament at the company picnic. I mean, you, you got to shift your mindset about the purpose of marketing in the first place before you can really start yeah, evaluating. Well, I'm glad its, we went there because you were hanging on the rim right there, buddy. I mean, that 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 the the mindset has to shift. It does, <laughs> and I mean, it's the value is there. Um, so, I mean, uh, thank you for your insight for, for what you unpacked there. You know, Joe, this has been awesome. You know, we, we, we call it eco ask why though. So, you know, I'm gonna wrap up with a why question. So mm-hmm. maybe to, for our listeners out there, why should they lean into this industrial marketing idea? Because I think it's critical to the success of manufacturers in the future, but I'm curious on what your why would be. Yeah. I think if I had to break it down into one thing, it's just the fact that referrals, and repeat business and reputation, like those those three R's are kind of the things that most manufacturers that are second, third generation family owned businesses, you know, a lot of the companies I talk to, like this is this is how they've built their business and and good for you. That's I mean, that's you know, for, for companies who have built their success on on just doing having a great product and building great relationships and hiring amazing people and having phenomenal customer service. Like that's fantastic. And um, I I think just the challenge today though, is that like we talked about the very beginning, the way people are buying is changing. And the more, um, the more that, you know, the next generation starts to move into leadership roles at the companies you're trying to reach and not only leadership roles, but all kinds of roles, you know, they're, they are looking for information in different ways. And those, relationships and reputation will only take you so far. They will absolutely continue to play a role. Um, but you need to be thinking about how your audience consumes information and how they buy and you need to meet them where they are rather than forcing the way you want to sell product on them. That's right. Got to meet them where they are, my friend. Mm-hmm. Very good. Well, Joe, this has been great. Thank you so much. You unpacked a ton. Uh, for the listeners out there, check out the show notes. Joe, where, where do you want them to go to to connect with you, see all the wonderful things you're doing at, at Gorilla76? Sure. So Gorilla, like the animal, G-O-R-I-L-L-A 76.com. Uh, I would probably direct you to our learning center. You'll find it in the top navigation. And we produce just a ton of content, uh, video, podcast episodes, um, written content for 
specifically for manufacturing leaders and marketing people in the manufacturing sector. So I direct you there. Uh, my podcast is The Manufacturing Executive. It is for CEOs and presidents and you know, C-suite and marketing leaders at manufacturing companies. So I'd send you there as well. And I'm one of 10 million Joe Sullivans on LinkedIn. But if you you know put together Joe Sullivan and Gorilla76, you'll find me there. So please reach out. Absolutely. And, and, for, and to make it even easier for you guys, go check out the show notes. We'll have all those links there for you and you can c- connect directly with Joe. So thank you so much for your time today, Joe. Thanks for having me, Chris. This was a lot of fun. Yes, sir. That was a great conversation with Joe Sullivan. I'll tell you what, from everything he's doing at Gorilla 76, he is helping those industrial markers c- connect the dots for manufacturing. I'm tell you what, he covered so much and I really enjoyed how we talked about the VOC because you have to really understand what's important and you ask good questions. And then from there, you build the content that makes a difference. So tell you what, there's so many good nuggets in that conversation. Go back, check it out, take your notes, grab a notepad, because you're going to have to get that to, 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 to uncover everything that Joe went through there. So highly encourage you guys to go check out what they're doing at Gorilla 76, as well as the manufacturing, manufacturing executive podcast. He does phenomenal work there. Now the war stories. Keep them coming. We've we've dropped an episode out there already. We we got them more coming in. And I'll tell you what, the war stories, they're fun, they're exciting, and we're trying to connect industry and, and, and celebrate all the fun things that happen out there on the plant floor. So go to the show notes. You'll be able to connect us with us directly on our social media platforms and do that. And if you like an eco SY, we will ask you to share it with someone. Send them an email, send them a text, give us a rating and review. That that goes a long way. Because it really makes an impact. We're trying to get this to as many people as we can because we feel like this, there's so much to be offered in manufacturing. And it's the people and ideas that make a difference. So I hope you have a great day. And remember, keep asking why. <laughs>